Hi, how's it? We're in the next part. So in South Africa, there is a very bad case of gender-based violence. Uh, men killing women and very horrifically so. So you would imagine my horror when I found it in a man that is not in South Africa, but is in the US. It's like, whoa, can we go anywhere as South African women and find rest in men without fearing that we're gonna, you know, die on the driveway as we are pulling out of a man's apartment? <clears throat> That we have decided to leave because we don't want to be with them anymore. Are we are we gonna keep on finding bullets in our skulls or what? In the previous part, I described a story in the US. Oh well, I, there's a show that I watched on DSTV. I used to watch it regularly. Um, about two or three years ago, of this like one lady that kept on getting stalked by this dude in China, and he ended up dead. You're gonna have to go and check out pre uh, part one, okay? Uh, in order to get that the full story, because it's quite the story. It's longish. I'm not gonna recap on it all that much here. All you need to know is that the dude ended up dying. Now let's move into the next part. I am a South African woman and I've already suffered my fair share of gender-based violence uh, from my countrymen. Uh, as, a South as, a, as a South African woman, especially if you are black, you have likely experienced, if you get to just even the age of 15, some form of gender-based violence, be it in the in exorbitant rudeness of men against you and so harass you for that for no other reason than the fact that you're a woman lots and lots of attack on social media or you've been slapped or hit or pushed or shoved or locked in a house all day long without being able to get out by a boyfriend to the extreme end of that perhaps ended up in hospital because of one or worse six feet under if at all you have not had a man lay a hand on you or anything of that nature or been harassed you have most definitely be whether or not you know it been handled handled really in inverted commas quote marks by men using witchcraft they come at your career with it so they can subdue you to emptiness and poverty. They come uh, to you with. They come to uh, at your 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 dignity. So they will may they will try and convert you into a harlot, uh, a promiscuous woman, a woman with an unacceptable sexual proclivity. They will manipulate that with witchcraft, make you the lady that has slept with four guys in the office. And before you know it, you don't even know how that happened. How you allowed yourself to sink into that, that cesspool so that they can defame you, revile your reputation. You could be, they might come at your health, so deliberately infect you with HIV or some form of venereal disease that they know they have that they will not tell you they have until you have got to now get tested for it at the doctors. Yeah, there are multiple forms of GBV, gender-based violence that slap women in this country. And it is a well-known fact by us all, South African women, that we live in the country that, that is the, the worst one to live in as a woman. Statistically, that's a thing. South Africa is the worst nation in the world to live in as a woman. And I would go so far as to say, especially as a black woman, because the majority of cases are black women. However, there are some cases, of course, of non-black women. Uh, the large majority of them, though, are us, right? Unfortunately, however, there's very little intervention by said black women or women at all on behalf of women before they have been hurt like this. So that exacerbates the issue. It adds fuel to injuries fuel to fires, salt to injuries, insult to injuries. The fact that women are not helpful. They are so envious of each other that they allow themselves to throw other women into the laps of dog men. And so it's almost as if though these men are getting rewarded for their insanity, so there's no incentive for them to stop. And so for those reasons, the situation just keeps on growing um, exponentially. Well, being a South African woman with this for my dating pool, it of course came as a breath of fresh air to me when then I met a man in the United States of America. And I imagine that I am exiting the borders of my country, so therefore, there is no such thing that's going to follow me around. And I got most abused by him than by any South African male could ever, like, literally, no one in my country compares to this man in terms of his sorcery and what he would have done to me had he been in my physical environment. So let us get into the dreams, the visions, basically all that which God is communicating to me about this man. For the past couple of days, perhaps three to four, the Lord has been saying to me, why are you worried? You're, 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 you're like, why are you worried? Because the thing is, when a person sends a spell to me, I dream it. Sometimes I even feel the effects of what it's trying to do. And I got to resist until I conquer on the other side. Indeed, it is written in God's word that resist the devil and he will flee from you. So the bombardment spirit 
spiritually that I get sends me into such a spiral of panic because I'm sick and tired of fasting and having to ward stuff off that I become untrusting and desire to basically take matters into my own hands. I become internally very aggressive and unforgiving and in that state god then is constantly rebuking me telling me why are you worried literally with that kind of tone it's almost as if though there is an irritation in god at my mistrust but in that state he he remembers that we are dust and so he has compassion on us it's written in god's word the lord remembers that we are dust so he then counters the visions that i get with um with, with the visions that i get of this darkness right he then counters those visions with pretty much what he is going to do despite god showing me what he's going to do i still continue to fear free god because i am like i said made of dust i should be walking by by faith and not by sight but it's very hard to ignore the sight because the thing that this man is doing to my life like the, the effects of his sorcery in my ecosystem they're so cat so cantankerous that i can't help but be upset at god for not thwarting him sooner and when i ask god why why are you not just neutralizing this guy um and the lord then tells me you know that's like just this afternoon actually this is what he said but in almost like it's not the third person what would like you know when you overhear a conversation what are those people speaking in is it the third person or whatever i don't know it's like i i god gave me a word of knowledge of a conversation that he had with this man he is a professing Christian and has been dilly-dallying in lukewarmness pretty much since he was 15 years old. He is 42 now. And I overheard a conversation with, that the Lord was having with him. And in this conversation, he said to this guy, just this afternoon, this is what I heard. I stood at your door and I knocked and you ignored me. You know, in Revelation, that lukewarm church, Laodicea, the Lord says to them, behold, I stand at your door and I knock. If anybody will allow me in, I will come in and I will dine with them. Yeah, basically God is telling me that he has been standing at this guy's house knocking ever since he claimed to be a Christian and he has been ignoring him. And now he has gotten to a height where that is frankly unacceptable to God. He has put himself out of a, a, a pool of grace, a, an era or a season of grace. When I was using the bathroom, I'm sorry for the details. If you don't want to have to imagine that, don't. Indeed, gouge out your eye. Uh, literally sitting on the toilet seat, I heard the Lord saying, um, uh-uh, no, why is this thought leaving me? Why in the world is this thought? Um, yes, women, thank you. When I was peeing, the Lord said, you will be the last woman. That's what, that's what I heard when I was on the bathroom, when, when, when I was on the toilet seat. You will be the last woman. You will be the last woman. So essentially, this guy has got a track record. Strown behind him is a trail of cadavers of women that he has just lain waste and devastated in his past. This man is is a victimizer and he has been leaning on his profession of Christianity to pretty much get away with the murders that he has committed over the years. Some of them quite literally, literally as in women have died because of his deeds from what God has shown me and others figuratively in the sense that their lives have been devastated by him. He has mown them to the ground. He has he has cata um, cataclysmized, if that's even a word, catastrophized, if that's even a word, the lives of a slew of women, like I said, strewn all over the proverbial road, scattered, are proverbial yet again, and some of them, they're not even a proverb or a metaphor, literal cadavers of women. That is what I walked into, unbeknownst to myself. And it is precisely, was precisely, and currently still is, the position that I find myself in that drew this man to me. If I was strong, if I still had my own career, or even just at a minimum loved by family, I would have been too strong for him to be a victim of his. So he chooses them like this. He, he, he desires that they be weak, that he be the one to take care of them and then control the living daylights out of them until he burps, until he's tired of them. So many of these women, he has just left them high and dry in the past after taking care of them. And some of them, when he wanted to go back to them and they said no, he literally ended their lives. Not with a physical knife, 
and a physical gun, but with spiritual weapons. The Lord has shown me that this man has been involved in the occult for longer than most, and he has easily just conjured up death curses and killed women that either dumped him or made him feel worthless, emasculated him, anything at all that he felt, you're gonna get it. He neutralized them. Watched family members bury these women, knowing that it was his death curse that caused her to get into a car accident. His death curse that caused her to suddenly get a case of bronchitis that was incurable. His death curse that caused her to commit suicide. There have been suicides. His death curse, yeah, etc. God was like, this man has got a rap sheet longer than the legs of Giselle Bunchen. And there is mercy in me for him because I have compassion on how he grew up. I have mercy on how he was caused to be like this. And I've been trying to draw him to a better state pretty much since he claims to have given his life to me. I've only ever stood at his door and knocked. He's never opened the door. But his life of crime has caused him to imagine, sorry, to profess me. Because it was his way of guaranteeing himself heaven despite living like the devil. How can I describe this guy? I don't know if you guys back in the day used to watch that uh, gangster show The Sopranos. You know how the main head honcho criminal man used to oh, every so often go in for confessionals with a Catholic priest. Yeah, uh, the way the Lord describes this man to me and his character, like this is what I fell into. His relationship with Jesus is one where he pretty much goes there into a confessional every day to a Catholic priest while continuing with a life of crime. He's like Tony Soprano or like Pablo Escobar. You know how Pablo Escobar every so often was would consult with, again, it's always these Catholic priests. They have, they, they don't de denounce Christianity or Catholicism or religion. Um, they hold on to it precisely because the wickedness that they have walked in, the crimes they have committed all throughout their lives are so exquisite that their consciences that beat on them throughout their crime careers make it such that they then run to God just in case he's real and could take them to hell. And so they hold him like an accessory, a badge, and it, like something that they just kind of pin on like a brooch rather than actually wear him for propitiation. They don't repent. They just commit crimes haphazardly, recklessly, and fecklessly all throughout society and then go back and burp a prayer to God afterwards, saying that should I die tonight, please take me to heaven. Should I die, please don't let me go to hell. Precisely because they don't understand God and how he works, they take his mercy or his grace for granted. Because these criminal men know their consciences beat on them. So just like it is written in Romans 1, they are without excuse. They know there is a God and they're scared of what he will do to them for what they're doing. They don't have enough discipline to repent, however. So because, however, they do mildly seek out his forgiveness, the Lord then extends them an olive branch by standing at their door and knocking, communicating to them that you are a, Li a Laodicean. You are Laodicean. You are neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm. And so I'm going to spit you out of my mouth, but you know what the Lord says to the church at Laodicea. I'm actually looking for my little Bible. And we are going to read the letter to the church at Laodicea to you so you can understand what the Lord says to these criminal men that continue to commit abominations against God, knowing that there is some kind of righteous judgment that could come to them and cover themselves with confessions every so often of their crimes, but without repentance. And why am I in 1 Peter? I want to go to Revelation 3. The letter to the church at Laodicea it is written, Revelation 3 from verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. With that, you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, 
I have prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined. Uh, sorry. Uh, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. So I also conquered, uh, so as I also conquered and sat down with my father um, on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. When I was in the like bathroom earlier, the Lord was like, uh, not in, when the, when I was in the bathroom. That's when He told me. You're the lost woman. But before then, he had told me, this is my conversation with this man perpetually. I stand at your door and I knock. Lukewarm. It is written in Romans 9 that um, God will have mercy on whomever he will have mercy. And that the pottery cannot say to the potter, what have you done? Upon looking at how God chooses Jacob yet hates Esau. So to me, this man is so incredibly abominable that he ought just be neutralized straight away. And yet God grants him mercy. And I cannot understand why he is being given mercy because he has laid a chokehold on a Christian woman. And when the Lord then tells me that this guy has God strewn behind him, a trail of cadavers of other women whose blood basically is crying out from the ground for justice that he has slain i'm like what in the world why have you been wasting time with this guy and the lord's response to that is i will have mercy on whomever i will have mercy and this dude could have been knocked out long ago for the menace to society that he is Yet here he is being made to linger in this apostate stalking of a Christian woman. And this time around, she's truly saved. But the Lord has said, precisely because this time around you are trying to extinct my own daughter, extinguish her like a flame, she will be the lost woman. So either she will convert you to me or she will send you to hell. But this will be the last woman. He's 42 and has apparently been doing this from as early as the age of 15. Can the Lord be more long suffering? Can the Lord have more fortitude over the sin of so an abominable being as that? But that's just the thing. In the case of Paul, who was initially Saul, known as the chief of sinners, he was even given a whole supernatural experience en route Damascus, where the Lord said, why do you persecute me? Some of us look at that and we're like, why are you even negotiating with this rando? He keeps killing your Christians. He keeps murdering your disciples. So there is this um, testimony of this one Muslim convert to Christianity guy that I watched not so long ago. And this guy was one of those extremist Muslims that were into killing people, jihad and everything. He had the blood of many Christians on his hands um, and he, he was sent to the Lord. He repented from a supernatural experience where he kept on groveling and begging and groveling and begging Allah to respond to him. And the person who responded was Jesus. And then he got saved. That man had killed so many Christians that one would wonder, why in the world did you just knock this guy out because he is a thorn in the flesh of the body of Christ? And well, the answer by the Lord to that question ultimately was, I have come to gather for myself a people for my own possession. And he finally came home, did he not? That was my prodigal, nah, prodigal son leaves home. This dude never apostatized from Christianity and came back. He was first Muslim. So he got saved despite being the chief of persecutors. He's like a modern day Paul, a modern day Saul. He got saved. So why the Lord keeps on bantering into our core? Forgiveness is precisely because some people that appear violently far gone eventually repent even though you just don't see it coming. There's such menaces that we are better off as a planet, never mind the body of, ne ne never mind the, just the body of Christ, without them. Like there are people that when they die, everybody breathes a sigh of relief because there was such a menace. 
but when they repent, they are known as the chief of sinners. And heaven rejoices when they repent. And the body of Christ, many of them who are persecuted by the same people are shocked that, oh wow, uh, something finally worked. I am embittered by the level of sorrow that I have endured the past almost nine years. I have suffered sufficiently from South African randos. And then I then have to suffer more sorrow, more macabre feelings of despair because of the perpetual sorcery that keeps on getting thrown in my environment by some Dumbo, I would imagine, in America, who I wouldn't even miss if he died. I would not even find out. I frankly would just experience relief. Relief and never know that he kicked the bucket. Why God not just take him out since he's already been such a menace? And then the Lord reminded me of the testimony of this one oak that, again, not very long ago, it's funny how everything just so happens to providentially jump into this little basket in perfect time. And an American man who now runs a Christian ministry on YouTube. Forgot his name, some dude with light eyes, brown eyes. He's got like these super uh, hazelish eyes or whatever. He's married now. He's in his 30s. He could be my age. Um, but when he was about 24, he confessed. And I just happened upon, by the way, that particular confession. I don't even know how I... Oh, yes. How I uh, clicked on his particular video as it was being recommended. Um... He was speaking about how people with narcissistic personality disorder feel when they get dumped. And he says that he was saved out of narcissism by the Lord. And how it is that he was dating. Okay, so his story goes a little something like this. And it's going to be brief. He was dating when he was in university or call it college then America. When he was in university, he was dating some lady. And he used to treat her like trash. She wasn't very good to her. And ultimately, this woman, at some point, was like, I'm done. Like, goodness, you suck. And it was not so much that, that he loved this woman, that he was offended, or that he was sorrowful over the breakup. It was that she left him. Again, narcissistic personality disorder. Just because she finally stopped allowing his abuse, his verbal abuse, his lack of respect for her and his non-romantic ways and whatnot again he was a very handsome man i told you he's got these like hazel eyes and whatnot so basically women were just falling all over the show in his presence tripping it up a storm unable to keep their ghoul and when this woman finally dumped him to him it was like no one dumps me and it got to his ego so badly that he tried to get back with her just so he could be the one to dump her. And when she was like, no, I don't want you, you mistreat me. He lost his mind. He lost his mind and started stalking this lady. And he speaks about how she she was uh, in, um, what do you call it? She was working. She had a job. So he was still in varsity, but this woman had a job. Maybe she was older than him, or maybe she was both working and studying at the same time. And he spoke about how he would basically linger around outside of her offices. Linger. Drive. Like, eerily creepy. Making like Michael Ely in The Perfect Guy past her apartment. Maybe even park there for several hours to a point where he, she would see him. Spoke about how she also um, got a restraining order against him. And he mentioned, he uh, confessed that he would never have stopped doing what he did if he did not have an encounter with Jesus. Because he was told that if you don't stop with these shenanigans, I'm going to end you. Because you are not about to go and make that woman live a miserable life for the next five years. He was made to discover that he's a narcissist because he didn't even really love her. He was just offended that she dumped him first. He wanted to get back together with her just so he could eventually be the one to dump her. It was all about his pride. It was all about his narcissism. Narcissism. This guy from the US, he came into my life Love bombing the living daylights out of me through all different kinds of gifts all up in my grill. I, however, had a lot of qualms with his doctrine. I had a lot of qualms with his lifestyle. I also had issues with the fact that he confessed to me that it was not long ago since he last fornicated, claimed he had repented. I felt like he was kind of fluffy and I also used to ask him a, a lot of questions. Of course, that's what you do when you are starting out with a person. And he got agitated by that. 
and his irritation didn't sit well with me so as a result i sort of kind of was like i don't know if this is gonna work um i then was like maybe we should take a break or dump him basically and this dude lost his mind predictably just like this guy like the when this other dude was telling his story i was like that's what happened with me i could identify all the hallmarks I was like, this guy got really super crazy in my grill because I was the one to walk out. And when he tried to come back, first of all, um, because I still had feelings for him, I would often, I, I remember writing him uh, an email telling him that, yo, look, get your act together. Plus, you know, my loneliness really will make a woman act a fool. As I get your act together, don't you see that even the way that you currently treat me is because of witchcraft in my ecosystem. Everybody in my life is a witch. And after I updated my status, my relationship status on Facebook from, because we like proper, he proposed marriage to me in like two seconds. When I changed it from single to engaged, I got a slew of sorcery indeed from friends on Facebook, witches in my life, etc. And I was like, look, you're acting like this because witchcraft is an operation. You need to resist the devil and he will flee from you because I thought he was a Christian and this dude was like he imagined that me writing him that email to warn him to basically fight a spiritual war he imagined that that was me groveling and begging at his toes a man that was so used to manipulating women with witchcraft that he thought that that was me begging and twiddling around at his toes to come back or to do better by me and that's when he wore a typical narcissistic outfit he acted cool and gave me so much shade on some look i don't want to be with some woman that keeps on dumping me because of misunderstandings so whatever man like every so often i'll send you some cash because i can see you're struggling in life but I, this can't work he treated me like i was a groveling begging thing that needed him after being heartbroken for something like a month, a month and a half, I completely moved on. And it was when I completely moved on that this guy started trying to come back, started trying to apologize, at which stage I was like, no. And on top of that, I had come to learn, because I was ignoring my dreams, that he was a hard knock satanist so who i thought was a christian turned out to be an occult practitioner in his own personal capacity doesn't even need to pay a witch doctor to do a spell but he does them himself in his own backyard and the taste or flavor of sorcery that he was much into from what the lord showed me was voodoo is voodoo this guy is a voodoo practitioner and he has been one since as far back as like from what the Lord showed me since he was just a kid like maybe 20 19 years old he's been doing voodoo and it has won him so many women witchcraft spells like love curses have have won him so many women he has slept with so many women that initially didn't want him because of this he has shattered caused the loss of jobs caused the loss of prospects businesses to fall apart he has caused so much calamity using this not just against women but men too just a man walking around life bitter and full of revenge he has been doing it for so long and getting what he calls results for so long that when he finally happened upon me he just imagined that he could come in and control the living daylights out of my life using voodoo while calling himself a christian so he could get himself a nice little third yes you heard it, third wife, because he's got two others that he has wreaked havoc in the life of. He imagined that I was prepared to embrace him as he came with those bad stats because he scrambled my brain with voodoo. Not taking into consideration the fact that I was a broken, barren, sophisticatedly persecuted woman who was hungry for any affection at all and the conditions around my life made me temporarily settle because I was tired of hurting. To him, I was just another thing that he was pulling around on strings to a point where he could, like he is so involved into in voodoo that he can't even tell the difference between something that is the real deal versus that which he is manipulating with his sorcery. My pain, my trauma caused me to compromise or want to settle because I just wanted to get out of this real quick. But he imagined that it was his voodoo working because he believed that his voodoo was what worked to make me like him at all. Um, and also accept his like twice divorced state. Uh, he imagined that he could control me 
it's he can basically do whatever he wants should he feel as if though his feelings are coming back or his feelings are still there and he just can't live without me he'll just you know do a spell and i'll be in his life again he wanted to handle me with it because he was like this one has so booty this one is not yet uh ripe she still is a bit feisty i know how to handle women how to brittle them how to subdue them to what i want and this one hasn't gotten there yet so i'm just going to bang her on the side and let her stew in a lot of sorrow that i'm going to put in her heart and then when she's at the height of sorrow freezing in antarctic brokenness i will then pierce through with my ice pick and be like look i'll give you a jersey but next time you better behave he wanted to do that with me but after ghosting me because that's what he did too for uh, uh, like as, uh, as, like he ghosted me and stayed ghostly for about a month and a half to two months in which time i i got over him completely and when then he was nice and ready to come back with you know handling me when i was like no thank you just like with the case that i explained in my first part of the woman who the guy wanted to apologize to and come back into her life and then she was like no i don't want this he then was puzzled and surprised because he was so used to getting what he wants using witchcraft that when i was like no it made him go mad and it was from that stage that i just i ha guys i just have not had the last of it i have been experiencing so much spiritual attack from this man because he can't believe for the life of him that this thing that he has leaned on and trusted all his life is not yielding the fruit that it has yielded so far in my life He's never encountered a real Christian and now he is and he is holding on for dear life to something that is not working but that he trusts one day will because everything in the past that he has ever used this on has ultimately capitulated to him except with me all I'm facing because of his hope and his belief is a lifetime of stalking. All I'm facing is years being stalked by the same man with the same sorcery. Never any capitulation for I am Christian. And the Lord has made it clear to me that the that because this guy is so into his thing and he so believes that finally I will do what he wants me to do. He has to go because he will never stop stalking. I want this to be a message to women to understand that these menaces, these monsters are everywhere and no human force can truly protect you from them you need jesus because the lord is the one that raises up and brings low and god is the one that can just by the breath of his mouth end a life on your behalf without you having to get blood on your hands and after you have tried and tried over and over again to be more mature, forgiving, not so angry all the time, being compromised because you're constantly being, you know, afflicted by a pest. The Lord knows how to remove a pest out of its way. But sometimes it takes a while for that pest to get out of the way because God has mercy on whomever he will have mercy. And in my particular case, the Lord, it appears, has had a soft spot for this guy for over like what, like two decades but now he is messing with the message of the cross coming through a disciple that he has chosen to give an end times message. And there is a very irresponsible fluff ball that just needs to be moved out the way. And the mercy of God is about to be uh, uh, fulfilled. It's about to reach the, the end of itself, brim over, fall, uh, fall over the brim. Otherwise, this dude is going to be to me like a terminal cancer. He will cause me to imagine that God does not care about me and so mess up my life. He is a spiritual cancer that in the absence of it being cut out and chemotherapy being done straight away on me, uh, I will die. I will perish. And I mean, it's really between me and him. And frankly, God is going to choose me. Next part.